All right, I, I need a help on two levels this morning. Um, I was supposed to do something that I neglected to do. Uh, Chris reminded me to bring some lollipops this morning, and I totally forgot to do that. So I need first, if we can stand up, just, just greet one another just for a moment, and if three of you can bring up a prize that I can give away to someone, then, then I'll ask for three more volunteers. So go ahead, say good morning, and if three of you can bring up whatever you think I can give out as a prize, that would be great. All right, I need three volunteers to help me out. And uh, Gabby promised, so come on up. Caroline, come on up. I need one more, maybe... All right, come on up, Eli, perfect. There you go. There you go. There you go. All right, we're going to have a a little bit of fun this morning because church should be fun at times. Um, And I wanted a buzzer, but we only have one buzzer from one game, so these are going to be our buzzers. So if you can turn them over, yes. Can you practice buzzing one time? Okay, there you go. You will have to help me discern which buzzer goes off first, okay? I've got three questions. I've got three awesome prizes here for you guys. And the first one that can answer the question that that buzzes, uh, you will get the prize, okay? You ready? Here we go. First question. Tell me two gifts you got last Christmas. Okay. Um, Headphones and an iPod case. Headphones and an iPod case. There you go. Weird, weird you had to pause on that, right? All right, here we go. Question number two. Tell me the worst decoration you put up every year. <laughs> it's this little tiny stick man. <laughs> okay. You can apologize to your mom or dad after. It's okay. All right, last question is a little more, well, a lot more serious. Um, Tell me one way that you would love to bless someone this Christmas season. Spend more time with them. Good. Do you have someone in mind? Uh There you go. All right. (laughs) All right. Thank you, guys. I'll take your buzzers back here. Enjoy your prizes. The the reason uh, that we did that is we want to make a commitment to you that as we head into Advent this season, that we're all fully aware of what we're beginning to ask. Uh, the question about presents, they pause, actually a little shorter than I thought. Um, but if I were to ask you two presents you got last year, it probably will take you a while. Maybe you would land on the sweater someone gave you that you still haven't worn. It's still in your closet. Maybe you'd go somewhere uh, because something triggered and you already have three of them and you remember you got a fourth one for Christmas last year. But then there will be some gifts that especially last year, I hope, would come quickly to mind. One of the, the gifts Esther gave me last year uh, as we tried to do Christmas differently as a church uh, was uh, I'm on this crusade uh, to get pictures printed. Uh, I love the fact that I, I can pull out my phone and show someone a picture, but I so miss the printed pictures uh, to be able to work through an album and laugh and share stories. And so Esther was really gracious as she creatively tried to think of ways to develop relationships. She printed off a bunch of pictures from our previous year, bought a photo album, and our gift is time together putting the pictures into the album. Uh, and, and hopefully some of you experienced some new ways of thinking about Christmas and gift-giving in Advent. Uh, We're going to ask you, I know the shopping season is on us, but very, very soon you're going to get very specific requests from your church 
on how you can shift to really make Christmas what Christmas is supposed to be. That God gave us His Son. And as we receive that gift, that we would give significantly to others. Which is that last question of time and relationships. And maybe blessing someone outside your normal circle. And at the end of the day, to financially be generous to those who are in need. Uh, We have some missionaries uh, that we would like to generously put some money towards. Uh, We have a few other things that we're going to ask you to generously give money to. Some of you will take this Advent conspiracy. And last year, our specific ask was, whatever money you spend on presents, could you match that by giving it away? Giving it away to very specific places that will ask you to contribute, or or you can choose your own. Uh, Some of you may say, I can't do that. For whatever reason, I can't do that. But to set a goal, is it $50 this Christmas that you're going to look to generously just pass along? Uh, So over the weeks, uh, we will continue putting Advent Conspiracy in front of you. I just ask, I know the shopping season is on us. I know the advertisements are here. I know Black Friday is coming. Could you just rethink, slow down, maybe not make the purchase that you were thinking of making, okay? Uh, You'll get more postcards. By the way, if you are not getting our emails, um, where are you, Jeff? Jeff Strong um, is a good contact point. If you can throw your hand back up, Jeff. There you go. If you haven't gotten an email from us recently or a letter in the mail or anything, if you could please just give Jeff your address and your contact information, and that way we can include you as we try to communicate with the church body as we travel through Advent. So you'll continue getting postcards, letters, skits, videos, um, as much as we can to communicate well with you. All right. We are kind of coming to the end of a series, If I Could Change the World. Just meaning, if I had the magic wand and I could wave it, what would I want changed in the world? And uh, you've had a guest speaker speak really well about affliction and persecution and how, how we handle that. Uh, we talked about how we treat women, hypocrisy, racial strife. And all of it, in my view, seems to zero in right on me very quickly. That my magic wand wants to change something about the world, but it doesn't take me long to realize that that's a change I need in myself. How I treat women, how I handle racial uh, stresses, how, how I look out on the world of persecution and enemies. It's become a very personal thing for me and hopefully for you as well. And this morning, uh, our title of the sermon is Materialism in the Moral Casserole. And when I was thinking about that uh, this week, I was thinking, what what do we call the world that we live in, in terms of morality and faith and, and walking along a certain path? And I thought, you know, that idea of a moral casserole is really interesting. That I throw some ingredients in, the ones I like, and I take some ingredients out, the ones I don't like, and I find what suits my need from the the television, from the blog, from the meditation, from the, the local yoga things, and I chuck those in and I mix them up, and I ultimately say, here's my sense of morality. Here's my sense of what's right and wrong, if I can even define what's right and wrong. And we cook it up, and we kind of think, now, maybe, we're good. The idea of materialism in a moral casserole. I want to show you uh, an example, kind of. We ready to project? I don't like graphs. No, I need to be honest with you. I actually do like graphs. <laughs> but they're not the most interesting thing. I, I get that. But the, the story that, that these things tell, I, I found pretty interesting and just wanted to share a couple of them with you. Uh, this comes from the Pew Forum, um, a survey they did, I think it was two years ago. 
And I selected, you could select any faith tradition. I selected Protestant evangelical churches, which is right where our church would slide into that category. And I clicked on beliefs and practices. And uh, this is what I found. For churches like us, belief in God or universal spirit among evangelical churches, 90, 90% believe in God, absolutely certain. 8% believe in God, fairly certain. And I was very glad to see that in the evangelical churches. 0% do not believe in God. That's good news to me. But then we move on. Uh, the importance of religion in one's life among churches like us. 79% say, yeah, that's very important. 17% say, somewhat important. 3% of us say, nah, not so much. Continues on. The frequency of attendance at religious service among evangelical churches. 30% of us go more than once a week. 28% once a week. 14% once or twice a month. 14% a few times a year. Some seldom, some never. And then the literal interpretation of Scripture among evangelical churches. That the Bible is the Word of God, literally true, word for word. 59% say, yes, that's true. 29% of us say, it's the Word of God, but it's not literally true, word for word. And 7% within churches like us, say it's a book written by men, not the Word of God. And our last two for you this morning. This is the interpretation of religious teachings among evangelical churches. 41% of the people sitting in these pews and pews like this say that there is only one true way to interpret the teachings of my religion. 53% say there is more than one true way to interpret the teachings of my religion. When that goes down to a final question, whether or not our faith is the one true faith among churches like us, 36% say my religion is the one true faith leading to eternal life. And 57% of us say many religions can lead to eternal life. I put that up there for you because it doesn't go beyond that. It doesn't talk about the practices. It doesn't talk about the morality. But can you see the trajectory that this thing is going? And if we played out a survey about what we believe about right and wrong, about morality, about what God expects, what He doesn't expect, do you think that there would be a coherent voice among evangelical churches? I don't think so. I think we would be dispersed like we were beginning to see when things got specific. I think we can extrapolate because we've all seen it, right? It's, it's the woman wearing the cross in Walmart, verbally abusing her kids. It's, it's the man who worships God on a Sunday morning right before walking away refusing to forgive your brother whom you haven't talked to in three years. It's sharing Christ with a friend and the gospel and and the good news and what God has done and He loves you before walking away and gossiping about another friend and blurring it all by saying, I'm just venting. You see, the, the idea of that God has a way for us to walk for many of us, is challenging enough that we say, not really. There are some things I like and some things I don't like. And what I like, I'll put into my casserole. What I don't like, I'm keeping out. It seems to me that it's not just people out there, but it's my life too. And yours. That we like to pick and choose the parts of our faith that we like and ignore or reject those we don't. And many of us in these seats this morning have this theological, moral mess that we've gathered together. We toss them in 
toss all their ingredients out. It's our favorite college professor. It's the latest book. It's what we feel about something that we import in. Maybe even from other faiths. We mix it together. We bake it up to feed our souls. The reality is you're trained to do that. Think of how many times in your daily life you get to personalize something nowadays. I mean, isn't it true? If you go to a website to order something and you don't have a chance to personalize it, meaning I want a green background, I want it rounded, not squared, I want my name but not my middle name on it, if you don't get that chance, isn't it a little like, well, let me keep searching. I want to personalize the website. I want to personalize personalize the order. I want to Photoshop the picture to make it look like I want it to, to look. I want to order the meal just like I want it. And maybe when we begin doing that with our faith, maybe that's okay. Maybe it's okay to just import it and exclude it and make it what we want it to be. Or, maybe when we personalize Jesus to suit our own desires, maybe we begin to fashion an idol that we worship. And maybe that's really not okay. For some people, I think we stand in that place because we just literally don't know any better. We're we're confused that no one has mentored me, no one has taught me, no one has loved me in community, no one has guided me on how to handle relationships and how to address these questions, and I just don't know. And so you left by your own device. It's just picking from familiar places in your life. Something your parents taught you, drop it in. Something you learned in college, that sounds good. Because you just don't know any better. I think for all of us, whether it's a pastor or someone sitting in the pews, we need people around us to help us understand God's direction in life. It's why we have discipleship groups. In fact, the window is closing shortly, like this week kind of shortly for most groups. I want to encourage you, if you are trying to work through life in a way that you want to please God, but you just don't fully know and it's hard, I want to invite you to join one of our discipleship groups. Uh, we have quite a few that meet throughout the week, uh, a couple on Sundays. It's why we offer these so that we can help each other change lives, help us journey towards Jesus, help us understand what is God's desire for me. But for some of us, it's not confusion. It's not a lack of knowing. It's arrogance. For some of us, there are certain things that you do not want to change. There are certain areas of life that you refuse to give up. Certain patterns, certain habits, certain desires. And at the end of the day, in arrogance, we stand up. And we say, God, you will not speak into this area. And our faith, our walk, is altogether different. When we refuse to give things up, when we refuse to listen, when we say, I know more than those who came before me. You have no right, Pastor. You have no right, Scripture. You have no right, God, to speak into this area of my life. Maybe a third way we get to that place is a misconception. And it goes like this. God is full of grace. Therefore, if I continue to step over here, deliberately sinning against Him, deliberately doing what I want, deliberately saying, I don't really care, God. He's going to forgive me anyway. And it's all going to be good in the end. And in that misconception, we forget something truly vital. That forgiveness is not free. That God paid a high price 
to offer forgiveness. And in that high price, God will not be mocked. And yes, God is full of grace. And God forgives all. But do not think you can play games with your Father in Heaven to do what you want to do because you know you have a good Father. Because He's also righteous and holy. All right. That's a long way of introducing Luke chapter 18. If you can turn there with me, Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 18. Luke chapter 18 is the story of a rich ruler, which really is just a guy with influence. We kind of assume he's in the the temple leadership. It's hard to think church leadership because the temple was the ruling body for Israel. So it's like maybe a pastor, an assistant mayor, and the police chief kind of wrapped into one guy. And he's coming up to Jesus. He's an influential, successful guy. Verse 18. A certain ruler asked him, meaning asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. One of the things I think that all people at all places over all time have always wanted to know is what do I need to believe? How do I need to think? What things do I need to know? about this life and whatever life there is to come. We're always asking questions about God, aren't we? How many of you live with a child who's six years old or younger? Okay. Those of you who have ever had a child six years old or younger know that they ask questions that are impossible to answer. But you don't know the half of it. Because some of these children have pastors for their dad. They have moms who say, why don't you go ask your dad? He'll know. And so the, the latest one that, that we had to, to field, that ultimately I had to field, is somehow Sienna learned the game. Sienna's five years old. Somehow she learned the game of tug of war, which is cool. Uh, Ethan learned about it in physics, and it's great. Until the question comes out, Daddy, who would win? Every human being who has ever lived on one end of the rope and God on the other end of the rope. (laughs) To which, of course, I gave the sage answer. I'm pretty sure, honey, God doesn't play tug of war. (laughs) Whether we're little kids or whether we're grown adults, we have questions about God, about who He is, what He's like, what He expects from me. And so this young ruler asks a question, what's the way to the eternal kind of life. That really is a phrase, when we think of eternal life, most of us think, all right, it's the life I have now, there'll be a slash, a period, a new paragraph, whatever instance you want to put there. There's an end, there's a break, and then I step into eternal life in heaven with Jesus forever. That's basically our image, but that's not the image that this man would have had. Because for the Jew in Jesus' day, and I think faithful to the Scripture more, is the eternal life with God, the the life of eternity, the, the life that God designed, has been thrust into our history and our life now. And so the eternal kind of life, the life of the age to come, is a life that we can experience even now. It's not just a time thing that I need to die and then I get eternal life. The question is, that life that you've designed, God, I know it's good, and I know one day I'll be there fully, but how do I import that into my life now? 
How do I experience your kind of life, the life of the age to come now? Or maybe a more faithful translation is not inherit, but gain possession of, to share in, to receive. How can I be a part of that? Which is the question of every religion. Every religion seeks to answer that question. How do I secure, inherit, gain possession of eternal life? Every religion tries to answer that. The reason is because eternity is written on a man's heart. And it doesn't matter if he's Asian or South American or North American, Canadian, Hawaiian, it doesn't matter. Eternity is written on our hearts, and because of that, we're almost forced to ask the question. I can't live without knowing. I'm going to go nuts if I don't understand something about what God's desiring here. How do I secure the eternal kind of life? We search for this answer in books. We search for the answer in our favorite preachers on TV. We go to seminars, Zen yoga masters. It's amazing where we'll go to try to answer this question. And at least this guy went to the source. You know, at least he's asking Jesus. He's got a legitimate question that he puts in front of Jesus. Because it's important to know the right things. It is important to get our doctrine straight. That's actually what Bruce and Holly's discipleship group is beginning to do. That they would discover what the correct way of thinking and believing is and then translating into, now how does that affect me? How do I live that out? It's part of other discipleship groups too because we want to get a right picture of who God is and what He's done. But what if... What if all you knew about your dad is what you knew about your dad? You read about him. There was an article written. You chased it down. Other people have spoken about your dad and you've listened. What if the only way you knew your dad is you knew about your dad? Would you be satisfied with that? Maybe for some of you, that actually is your experience, that that maybe your dad left when you were a baby and you never knew him. Or maybe your dad passed away when you were young, and now it's just stories and filling in the gaps of knowledge. Does that feel insufficient? I think for all of us, if that's all I had, yes. That would be insufficient to me to just know things, believe things about my father. I suspect it would be the same for you. But we wouldn't be satisfied just reading about our dad, studying up on our dad. Something is still missing. and So Jesus has a follow-up here. Verse 20. You know the, the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. Jesus takes them a step further. That knowing God is not enough. Knowing about God is not enough. What about listening to Him and obeying Him? That seems to be a significant piece of what Jesus is saying. How do I inherit eternal life? Right now it sounds like, well, you've got to know some good things about God. And then Jesus is dropping the do and don't list. Do these things, don't do that, those things. Follow the rule book. It sounds like a a pre-launch checklist, you know? Before that rocket launches, here's our checklist. We go through it. Check one. No adultery. Good. I'm there. I've been faithful to my wife. How about, um, I wanted to kill my boss a few times, but I didn't. (laughs) Check. I've got that one down. I worked hard for everything I have. I never took from anyone else. As far as I know, I have never given false testimony, at least not officially, in front of a court. I'm good, I think. I still respect my mom and dad in their old age. I don't talk trash about them. I honor them. Check, check, check. 
And you can feel this man's emotion. Eternal life. Jesus is saying, it's right here. It's right here. I can almost grasp it. The idea of being good enough is very interesting. Many of us think, I'm good. This man thinks I'm good. I'm a good man. Certainly, if you put him in comparison to most others of his day, probably you're all nice folks. I I love you. And if you put you next to many people around you, you look good. You really do. Maybe that's the secret to have eternal life. Believe the right things and do the right things. And then we'll have it. So for those of you who have tried this, you know a secret. We always fall short. As hard as I try, as good as I may look at against someone else, deep down in my heart, I know there's something I'm hiding. There's something I'm keeping away. And even as we try to be good, even as we verbalize that, we just know there's a piece of us that isn't. Verse 21, the man pipes up, all these I've kept since I I was a boy, he said. This is great. I know God. I've obeyed God. This is what I was hoping for. This is why I asked the question. And then Jesus pulls out the one stick. You know, pick up sticks. We were playing that like with real sticks. It's impossible with real sticks. But with the, the fake game, you've got this pile of sticks and you try to remove one, but if you pick the wrong one, the whole thing just goes like, right down to the ground. It's like Jesus picks that one stick that, that he knows is going to send this whole thing crashing down. And so he gives one more piece of advice here in verse 22. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come, follow me. And Jesus picks up on the one area of life in particular that was kept out. Murder, good, adultery, and the like, they're all given. But money? Now that's personal. Come on, Jesus. My checkbook? Seriously? You want me to deplete my accounts? I've worked hard for these things. Hands off. In fact, you see his reaction here. Verse 23, he doesn't even argue. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. I can give everything, Jesus. I can obey whatever you ask, except not that area. See, the real issue here is not that Jesus is saying, if I drain my bank account and give it to the poor... Somehow I've gained eternal life. But for this man, and for all of us, the issue is, who am I trusting? Because God doesn't want your obedience as if you can impress Him. God wants your trust because you love Him. Do you see the difference? It's like a father. If your child obeys you constantly, but doesn't love you and you know it, how does that work out? As a dad, you, you keep trying to step closer. What's going on? I love you. I, I, I don't understand your hesitation. Your obedience is great, son. But it's not what I want. I want your heart. And God has the same mindset to us. It's not our obedience primarily He wants. He wants your heart. He wants you. And the only way he gets that is when we begin to trust him with everything. Not just the things we like, but everything. The eternal kind of life is when your life is so wrapped up in Christ that you trust your Father fully. And whatever he asks, you willingly, lovingly do. You see, Jesus doesn't want obedience. He wants everything. Jesus wants everything. Our tendency is to give God some things. We'll obey these that are easy. 
I'll allow him to change this area, but not that area. We pick and choose. And it's interesting to me. If you just scan your eyes up, just a few verses of Luke 18. Verse 15. This is a story preceding this rich young man. People were also bringing babies to Jesus to have him touch them. When the disciples saw... I don't know how old babies are. I tried to do a little digging. They're young, all right? Maybe they're walking. Maybe they have diapers. Maybe they don't. They're really young kids that are coming up to Jesus. People were also bringing babies to Jesus to have them touch them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Think back to the days that you were raising babies, little children. How dependent upon you were they? Totally, right? I mean, unless you've got some mutant independent kid, babies are totally dependent, meaning they totally trust you, even when you're not perfect. And I think this contrast is amazing for us in that Jesus sees the babies coming. They fully trust. They're excited. Are they smiling? Yeah, I mean, at least that's what all the paintings paint out. The kids are smiling when they come to Jesus. And yet this rich young ruler, he walks away sad. You have happy babies trusting God, trusting Jesus. And you have a sad, rich, young ruler who can't fully trust God. I picture pure gladness with the kids, not holding back, smiles, joys. And there's something in that experience that Jesus points to as the examples of those who want to lay hold of eternal life. Let me end by sharing this with you. The reason you can trust your Father in the heavens with everything, and in that experience a piece of this eternal kind of life of trust and joy and peace, the reason you can trust your Father fully in heaven is because He is good and He is for you. You see, not all of our fathers were like that. And we had to hold back a little bit because we didn't really know what, what would dad do, how would he react. Some of you have lots of experience with that because fathers have power. Fathers have power and kids trust them and sometimes that can be abused and some of you know that. But let me share this. Good fathers have power, their kids trust them, and the kids are better off because they trust their good fathers. And I think that's what Jesus is getting at. You want the eternal kind of life? The life that God intended, that swooping down through Jesus into this life? Trust your dad in all areas of life, even the ones you don't like, that if God says he speaks through the word of God, Say, okay, God, I may not fully understand how you did that, but I believe. If God says, forgive your enemies, and you want to say, but this enemy, no way. That hurt went way too deep. That was way too personal. Can I say, when you trust your Father and you follow His ways fully, the eternal kind of life will be yours to experience. There will be freedom and peace and joy in every endeavor, even for this rich man. If he had given it away, he would have been like, I now know what you're talking about, Jesus. This is the great kind of life, trusting in my heavenly Father. You see, Jesus wants everything, not because he's selfish, but because he loves you. And trusting Him with everything in our life is the best life that you could ever live. And only those who take that step in faith 
ever really get to know what that's like. The great news here, Jesus offered the invitation even to a rich young ruler. He opened it up. You too can come. And he does the same for you and me. That it doesn't matter what our past is. It doesn't matter what our stories is. It doesn't matter what we've held back. The door is open where God says, come, share my eternal kind of life. I want you. And because he gave what was most precious to him, his son, to die on a cross, to pay the price for the sins that we bring, that all could be forgiven, that all could be God's children, that same invitation to God's eternal kind of life is open for you. We just step in faith to say, okay, Dad, Abba, I trust through Jesus that you will carry me on for the rest of this life and the life to come. That invitation is why we exist as a church. That we might help people far from Jesus get close to Jesus and those who are following Jesus even go further up the trail. We just call it all discipleship. I want to invite you. If that's a step that you know God has been inviting you to take, come and find me after the service. I'll I'll be up front here. There'll be a lot of commotion. We have some boxes being packed. Uh, You are all invited to stay. Uh, It's a great way to get to know some people in the church. Uh, Stay after, have a party. But if you want to have a fuller conversation with me, we'll we'll find some quiet space up here after. Uh, Let me invite our worship team up as we close in prayer. Father, we come before you, and we ask that you peel the curtains of our life open, that you would reveal the areas that we've withheld from you. And God, by the compassion, the compassionate ministry of your Holy Spirit, would you move us to repent, to allow you in, to trust you even in those areas. And Lord, you have always been faithful to your promises. And we trust that you'll be faithful to your promise that we will experience the eternal kind of life, the life of the ages to come, even now when we give it all over to you. Lord, may you tear down our fear. May you build up our courage to follow you fully because we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.